Hi guys and welcome to my channel. Today I'll be starting a new series called Framed. And in this series, I will discuss a case that has been solved and someone has been convicted for this crime. Now, I will discuss both sides of the evidence, the side that exonerates someone and the side that basically implicates that person as committing this crime. But once I review all of the evidence and analyze it, I will discuss my personal opinion on whether is this person guilty or is this person not guilty. And at the end of the video, I definitely want to hear your opinion and where you stand regarding this case. So stay tuned and let's get started. On June 4th, 1983, the Ryan family was murdered in their home. Of the family was Douglas and Peggy Ryan, the mother and father, 10-year-old Jessica and 11-year-old Christopher Hughes, who was a family friend that had stayed the night. Joshua, their 8-year-old son, had also been there that night. However, he survived. Now, although this case is very lengthy, it is very unclear as to what exactly transpired on the night of the actual murders, um, but I'm going to take from Josh Ryan's mouth and basically state from him what happened. Now, all three of the kids had been pretty much lured to the parents' bedroom after they heard the mother scream. Unfortunately, this is when Jessica was killed in the doorway. She had been hit five times with an axe and stabbed approximately 46 times. The mother had been stabbed 25 times and hit with the axe seven times. The father had been stabbed 26 times and axed 11 times, ultimately killing him and severing his finger. And Josh was also stabbed twice, once in his back, once in the back of his neck, um, he was hit in the head with an axe and his throat was slashed from ear to ear. Now, as an eight-year-old, it is astonishing that this kid survived. Although Christopher was there, um, Josh basically would not state how many times he had been stabbed and axed to death because he basically wanted to spare his family the extra heartbreak, which is completely understandable. Josh had been laying in his own pool of blood for approximately 11 hours after the fact until Christopher's father came to pick him up the very next day. And unfortunately, this is when he realized that the family had been murdered and contacted police. Once Joshua was interviewed at the hospital, um, Gamundoy, and I may be pronouncing that totally wrong, um, a social worker at the hospital he used a chart to basically interview Joshua and he asked how many people there were that attacked the family and he pointed to the number three. He asked if they were male and Joshua pointed to the word yes. And he asked if they were African American and he pointed to no. The, jo the social worker had asked Joshua if the people were white and he did point to yes. Joshua had ultimately said that he had seen the men before, um, but he did not know who they were. And he had ultimately he had jumbled information because he had seen three Mexican men prior um, in the day and they had come to the residence asking for work from the family and um, so originally the investigators thought that maybe these three men committed this crime. However, based on Joshua's health, it was determined that these were not the same men that ultimately killed the family. Because Kevin Cooper was convicted of this crime, we're going to focus on the evidence that pertains to him. And this evidence basically implicates him in the murder of the Ryan family. So there were fingerprints found in the house next door to the Ryan's house and Kevin Cooper made two phone calls from that house asking for money and help to get to the Mexican border. There were blood-stained items such as a green button um, from a prison issued jacket. There were blood stains found in the carpet, in the sink, and in the shower along with bloody footprints in the bathroom I believe. 
and there were also hairs found from the victims inside the shower drain and the sink drain. There was a hatchet that was found near the Ryan home and a strap fitting the missing knife from the lease home and both of those were said to be missing from the lease home. Also, the bloody shoe prints were said to be Cooper's size and brand because he did escape from prison, so he was wearing prison-issued um, shoes. And there was also a sample um, of blood that was found inside the Ryan home, and it was said to be African-American, but there was so little blood that they could not further test it to actually compare it to Kevin Cooper's blood um, because he was said to have a very rare type of blood. The station wagon that was missing from the Ryan's house was found in Long Beach and there were hairs that belonged to Kevin Cooper found inside the car as well as a cigarette. It was a manufactured cigarette and a hand rolled cigarette. And the tobacco that was inside the hand rolled cigarette was also prison issued. Um, and the cigarette butts were found at the Ryan house as well as in the car. Um, he later went on to go on this boat with these people. Um, and according to the woman, he raped her at knife point And once she had rep reported it to the police, there were several um, items missing from the lease house where Kevin was hiding and they were found on the boat. So now let's talk about some of the evidence that doesn't necessarily make sense if Cooper really did commit this crime. So there was a girlfriend of a, an inmate that pretty much thought that her boyfriend had been involved in this murder. There was a clump of blonde hair found in Jessica Ryan's hand. There were several changes in story from Josh Ryan, which is completely understandable. However, he originally stated that there were three white men that committed this crime. Several pieces of evidence were not originally found in the initial investigation of the lease house or the Ryan's house or the Ryan's station wagon. So the hatchet cover that was said to be in the bedroom, that was not found in the initial investigation. Um, cigarette butts that were found in the car as well as at the house were not originally found in the initial investigation. The bloody t-shirt that was found at a nearby bar or restaurant had both Cooper and Ryan's blood on it. However, it mysteriously just disappeared from police evidence. So that kind of raises red flags. EDTA had been found in the blood that was found on the t-shirt. There was an affidavit from the warden of the prison that Cooper escaped from saying that these were not the shoes that Kevin was wearing when he escaped. He was wearing a brown prison issue jacket when he escaped. Two women from a local bar near the crime scene saw three white men in bloody coveralls the night of the murders. Um, the woman that came forth and said that she believed her boyfriend may have been involved in this crime stated that he had came home at crazy late hour at night with a mysterious station wagon that she had never seen before. And a lot of this evidence raised a lot of questions. The boyfriend was also said to be wearing Fruit of the Loom brown t-shirt, which is very eerily similar to the one that was found outside of the bar or restaurant in which it was found. And as we all know, this brown t-shirt contained blood DNA from the Ryan family. Now, there were eyewitnesses at that same bar 
that stated they had seen three white men enter the bar and they were wearing coveralls and their coveralls were covered in blood. However, upon further investigation, the investigators basically stated that these women and men that stated that they had seen these people in blood could not actually verify that it was blood. It could be mud, it could be paint. So basically this theory was never 100% looked into really at all. I mean, there was um, there was a short period where the, the investigators did look into the crime, um, but it was more of a, oh, did you commit this murder? Nah, okay. All right, because we already have our suspect type of situation that happened. There really wasn't a very thorough investigation into this crime. Um, also, there was the station wagon that was missing from the Ryan home. Now, the girlfriend stated that the man had come home in an unfamiliar station wagon. And upon further investigation, there was blood from the Ryan family inside the car. There were there was blood in the driver's seat, the passenger seat, and the back seat. So basically stating that there were three people in that car. Now, she took this evidence to the police department and you're not gonna believe this. The police department decided that that was irrelevant to the Ryan case and they discarded of it. Not only did they discard of it, they burnt it. Without testing it, without verifying if it had anything to do with um, the case. She also stated that there was an ax and an ice pick missing from their home at the time of the crimes. Now, before I give my opinion as to whether Kevin Cooper is guilty or not guilty, in my own personal opinion, based on the evidence that I have included in this video, I definitely want to state first that a lot of evidence, a lot of evidence was not included in this video. Um, I just tried to focus mainly on the most damning evidence of the case, but please keep in mind that there were over 700 pieces of evidence in this case. Let's talk about Kevin Cooper's events that evening of the murders. So immediately Kevin Cooper admitted that he had been in the lease house basically taking refuge um, while he was hiding because he had escaped from prison. And he admitted openly that he was in this house. And he basically stated he made these two phone calls because he was he needed money and he needed to get to Mexico. So from this, what I can take from this is he needed money, number one. Now, upon the initial investigation of the crime scene, there was money found on the counter in plain sight. There was a purse that was on the counter and there was money sitting right next to it. Kevin Cooper admitted that on his way to Mexico, he stole someone's purse. If he committed this crime, why didn't he take that money off the counter? I mean, it was in plain sight. It was sitting right on the counter. So that's red flag number one. Number two is investigators stated that the only thing he really needed was a car. And if that was the case, why would you brutally murder this family in the extent that he supposedly did? I mean, that's way, way bizarre to me. And not only that, but the the Ryan family kept the keys in their car. They had a Chevy truck and they had the station wagon and both of them contained keys inside the car. And not only that, but Cooper was known for stealing cars. I mean, he was ultimately, he was a professional car thief. So he really didn't even need the keys. There would have been no reason for him to go into that house that night. 
people. If he needed the car as badly as the investigator said that he did, why would he drive 50, almost 50 miles out of the way toward going towards the Mexican border just to drop the car in Long Beach and then backtrack on foot to get to the Mexican border? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Then the evidence found was um, cigarette butts inside the car. Now, this car was originally investigated and there were absolutely no cigarette butts found in this car whatsoever. And almost a month after the car had been analyzed, all of a sudden someone was like, oh yeah, take a second look. And then all of a sudden they just found cigarette butts in the car. I don't think that, um, I definitely don't think that that would have gone unnoticed. Now the bloodstained items found in the lease home included bloodstained items such as a green button, bloodstains on the carpet, the sink, the shower, and there were bloody footprints inside the home. So first and foremost, let's talk about this green button. When Kevin Cooper escaped from prison, he was wearing a brown prison issued jacket. It had brown buttons on it. So where this mysterious green button came from, I'm not entirely sure. Um, another thing was there were blood stains on the carpet, sink, and shower. Now, the previous residents of the lease home stated specifically that they had cleaned the entire house with bleach. And I know some of you may not know this, but the chemical that is used to basically find blood also picks up bleach. So if you, you know, go to a crime scene and you spray that chemical, I'm not exactly sure what it's called, but if you spray it on there, it will detect blood and it will detect bleach. Because the investigator got a hold of these shoes, basically was the one who said, oh, we need to take a second look at the bed sheet and we need to take a second look at the pool cover when all of a sudden these shoe prints just miraculously disappeared. Um, also upon uh, initial investigation, the crime scene was not shut down. It was not immediately shut down. And there were up to 70 people just walking freely in this house. And to me, that raises a lot of red flags as well, because the first thing you want to do when you get to a crime scene, you want to preserve the crime scene. You want to preserve as much evidence as you possibly can. And this cannot be done if you just allow people to just walk among the crime scene. You're the evidence that is ultimately there <clears throat> is going to be painted. The DNA that was found on the t-shirt, the DNA that was found on the t-shirt that belonged to Kevin Cooper as well as various members of the Ryan family contained EBTA. And I'll put the word on the screen right about now because there is no way that I can pronounce that word. But, I will explain what it is. Now, when you get DNA taken from, you know, investigators or police department or whatever the case may be, they add EDTA to it. It is a preservative that basically ensures that your DNA is going to stay intact over a certain period of time. And basically, it can be tested for, for future use. Now, EDTA was found as, you know, with the DNA found on that t-shirt that belonged to Kevin Cooper, EDTA was found in that blood sample. So where did this mysterious blood come from? And the prosecutor actually, <clears throat> now before this DNA was tested, the prosecutor actually checked out or signed out or whatever you want to call it, Kevin Cooper's DNA. So this DNA was mysteriously missing for a total of 24 hours, which 
this 24 hours could have been used to plant this blood at the crime scene and at you know on the t-shirt so why on earth would a prosecutor need to take out anybody's DNA is beyond me but it's definitely possible that Kevin Cooper's DNA was planted where it was found and I know that um, Kevin Cooper has tried and tried and tried again to get this DNA tested and retested to basically prove that he is innocent but my issue with this theory is that they they're going to test this DNA and ultimately they did test the DNA but they're only going to do it because they know for a fact that this blood belongs to Kevin Cooper that is the only reason why they tested this DNA because it's only going to further implicate him as the murderer in this crime and I mean look at the, the other evidence the blonde hairs found in Jessica's hand why weren't those hairs tested still to this day almost you know 20 something years later this DNA has yet to be tested here so where did this mysterious blonde hair come from and why on earth hasn't it not been tested yet and there's a reason once again why they will not test this DNA they will not test this DNA because they don't want to exonerate Kevin Cooper they don't want to admit that they made a mistake and not only did they make a mistake but they made an intentional mistake and this was deliberately done by investigators and by the police department and unfortunately this blonde hair would lead to new questions that they will not be able to answer because they were so quick to jump on the bandwagon and say well Kevin Cooper escaped from prison Kevin Cooper did this he committed this crime but it came out of Joshua Ryan's mouth that three men committed this crime. Obviously, blonde hairs did not come from Kevin Cooper. They could have come from, you remember the girlfriend who stated her boyfriend could have been involved in the murder? They could have come from him or other accomplices of him. But this theory was, it was not tested. Yes, they say that they investigated and they looked into it, but I don't believe it. I don't believe it at all. And uh, it is it is so frustrating to me that the police department ultimately could have framed Kevin Cooper. And he has been sitting in prison for all this time for what? For a crime that he did not commit. And the new questions that they don't want to answer it's all gonna stem from well wait a minute so Kevin Cooper didn't really do it that means that the killer or killers are still out there now this isn't just a you know robbery gone wrong no somebody intentionally went to the Ryan house and intentionally killed them brutally so they do not want to carry that work that burden on themselves and as soon as the chief of police at the time was questioned, was like, wait a minute, you didn't know this was going on? He immediately threw his hands up and said, you know what, I'm done. Stop right there, I'm not talking anymore because you're not gonna sit here and accuse me of covering this up. Well, why are you being so defensive? It wasn't you, right? Oh, it was your department, but you didn't know about it? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense at all. I mean, prison issued shoes, you checked those out. DNA, checked those out. You didn't really look into anybody else. You immediately assumed that Kevin, Co Kevin Cooper did this and Kevin Cooper committed this crime and said, all right, evidence, take us to Kevin Cooper. That is absolutely backwards. That is not by any means how an investigation is supposed to go. Number one, you're supposed to preserve the crime scene. Number two, you need to gather the evidence and let the evidence take you where it goes. And where it leads, you need to be able to follow it up. So they completely and entirely messed this case 
up. And not only that, but they put their own little spin on things and basically plugged in all the missing pieces. Well, Kevin Cooper could have done it. Kevin Kevin Cooper could have not done it. Oh, well, you know what? We're going to put this little evidence right here and a little bit of blood over here. But remember that blood DNA that was found inside the Ryan home? That little bitty tiny speck of blood? You cannot possibly tell me that a murder this brutal and the only blood that you can find from the assailant or in this case Kevin Cooper was a tiny little drop of blood found in the hallway not even in the room where the entire family was found no way no possible way I mean just one person one person got stabbed oh almost 46 times and you mean to tell me that only one drop of blood was found inside the house that contained blood DNA that matched Kevin Cooper's blood? And this, this sample of blood was so minute that you couldn't even test it to 100% verify that it belonged to Kevin Cooper's. I don't believe it for a second. I 100% believe Kevin Cooper was framed and I believe he was framed by the police department. Before I conclude this video, I definitely want to apologize for seeming a bit all over the place with my thoughts and ideas and the evidence that was involved in this case. I know cases like this really get under my skin and I take this very, very seriously. Um, I know that the criminal justice system is in place for a reason, um, but ultimately I don't feel that the criminal justice system is without error. But I definitely want to know what you guys think. Do you think that Kevin Cooper was framed by the police or do you think that he played a part in this crime? Or do you think that he acted solely on his own? And with that, I would like to know your opinion as to what do you think the motive was for this crime? What do you think fueled such brutality in this case? Be sure to leave a comment in the comment section and I will see you guys in my next video.